let there be light. And there is light. That's right. Hey, I just want to say, Jenny Allen, it's been a year that you've been on our staff. Jenny and her husband, Peyton, uh, joined us a little over a year ago, uh, coming to lead our middle school ministry. He's doing a fantastic job. And a lot has happened in your life in that year. You got used to cold weather and all of us, and they're expecting their first child, so we're glad to have you and praying for you as well. That's exciting. She and all the young staff members at Chapel Street, just church growth the old-fashioned way. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us through his word. Father, we just pause now and acknowledge that uh, your word is living and active. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's eternal truth. It's practical. It's wise. It's able to divide our thoughts, our intentions, pierce us down to the soul. Sometimes we don't like that. We resist it even, but together in this moment, we ask you to speak to us through it that you might move in our hearts to shape us into the image of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's do a little review for those of you that are new to the series. We're in a series, as Jenny mentioned, called The Way, looking at the people of God. Early in the book of Acts, the first church, they called them people of the way. They followed this way, the way of Jesus, and it stood out in the Greco-Roman world. To follow Jesus stands out in every culture throughout history. And so we began by looking at the way of Jesus from John chapter 14. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And then the second week, we looked at the way of self-denial. Jesus says, if you want to come after me, follow my way, then you must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Then last week, we looked at the way of abiding from John chapter 15. Jesus says that if, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will bear much fruit. You can catch up on all those sermons if you miss them. But today we're looking again at the Gospel of John, a couple of passages about the way of love. Love, a nice, narrow, specific topic, right? We're going dis- to dis- talk about everything that has to, love, that has to do with love in the next few minutes. There's a lot of talk about love. There are signs on Facebook and on social media and in yards, love is love, love wins, got love. We talk about love in all kinds of ways. So much so, it's used so much that it's almost lost any real uh, teeth or sense of meaning because it's just used indiscriminately to mean whatever we want it to mean. I did a little Google searching, uh, found which is <laughs> dangerous. I uh, found a link after link about how to tell if you're in love with someone, how to tell if someone loves you. I mean, what pops up if you Google like what the, the rules of love or the, the marks of true love, it's all about how to know if somebody loves you. Some of the top ones on the search. Seven signs someone truly loves you, even if it doesn't feel like it. Twelve telltale signs to know if he or she truly loves you. Nine powerful signs someone actually genuinely loves you. Sixteen secret and surprising signs that someone is in love with you. And how to know if someone loves you? Thirty signs of true love. (laughs) There's a lot of signs or rules about. And all these things are like things to look for. But you know what I noticed? So I was reading through these and kind of getting a chuckle a little bit like we did. They're all about how to know if somebody loves me. There are almost no links to talk about how to know if I'm loving somebody else. Everything was about, am I being loved? Do they love me? Are they loving me? There are almost no articles to determine accurately, am I a loving person? Am I loving others? We all want to know, do others love me? But how many of us are asking, do I love others? And Jesus is going to flip this whole question around for us, as he almost always does in the Gospels. Turn it upside down and, ask the, and give us the rules, if you will, not to know if you're being loved. We talked about that last week, abide in his love. You are loved, but how to know if you're loving, reflecting who he is in the world. If we're honest with ourselves, I'm, we're like this. We tend to think this way. And we're going to look at two different passages from John's gospel that we're going to examine. We left off last week with John chapter 15 uh, and verse 11. He says that we, if we abide in his love, his words remain in us, and that's our source. So let's look at John 15 verses 12 through 17, picking up right where we left off last week. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. 
No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all that I've heard from my father I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Now, before we get to the next passage, there's just so much encouragement for us in our hearts in these verses. Jesus is saying, I chose you. You didn't choose me. I appointed you to bear much fruit that, that my love would abide in you and, and yours would abide. He's revealed to us the heart of the Father. He says, you're not just servants. You're friends, friends of the living God. And, and a servant doesn't know what his master is about, what his purpose is, what his reasons are. But I'm making known to you the heart of the Father. Do you think about that? Jesus is saying, if you're in, in my love, if you abide in me, you're not just workers in the field. You're my friends, and I'm telling you what the Father's heart is, revealing it to you. But the very first thing he does is he gives a command. Did you catch that? I give you a command. This is my commandment. And this commandment Jesus gives is actually repeating what he said in, in chapter 13. This is the story of the Last Supper, washing of the disciples' feet. And as they're departing from that supper, he gives them a new commandment. He says, John 13, verses 34 through 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's interesting that Jesus does not give a, a suggestion. Here's how I think it ought to go. Jesus doesn't say that. Here's my best advice. Here's, some, here's some, uh, some, my opinion or some philosophies you might want to adopt. He says, I give you this commandment. But is it strange to think about love as a commandment? It, it is kind of if you think about it, isn't it? Like, is it healthy to say, I command you to love me? Does love work that way? You must love me. It doesn't work like that. So why is Jesus saying, and what's new about it? Doesn't this show up in the Old Testament? Are we told to love the Lord our God and love our neighbor? It's not new in that it's never been said before. What's new about this commandment is it's never been embodied like this before. You've never seen love in the flesh like this before. Personified, acted out before their very eyes, going to the cross. That's what's new about it. And frankly, there's all kinds of commands that we need because we, we drift away and resist that which is most important for us. And we have to keep in mind who's saying this. It would be wrong for you to command and demand that everyone love you. But this is the God who made you in his image, who's given his life for you. Of all beings in the universe, he has the right to give you this commandment. Not because he's demanding something of you that's bad for you, for his own pleasure, because he made you and knows what's right for you. It's really an invitation for you to live the way you were designed. So we see, first of all, the way of Jesus is the way of love. The way of Jesus is the way of love. And the way of love is embodied and defined and shaped by the person of Jesus himself. We're going to talk about this. But when we say the way of Jesus is the way of love, it doesn't mean love however our culture defines it. Love based on your personal sensibilities or preferences. It means love as embodied and defined by the person of Jesus Christ. This is how we know. This is what we're going to talk about. We're following his way and his definition of love. So what I want to do is ask four questions about the way of love. Four simple questions, which might be kind of obvious, but I think they're important for us to get underneath what's being taught to us here, what's being said to us. First question. What is love? How many of you right now have a song in your head? Boom, 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 boom. What is love? I did. When I wrote that down my notes. I'm like, oh, oh, no. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you're not from my generation, right? You know? right? Maybe you have different songs in your head. Certainly, we don't all mean the same things we throw around this term, like, I love my wife's chocolate chip cookies, which I do. I love the Chicago Bears, but they don't love me back. <laughs> Yesterday, I did a wedding for a young couple, and of course, love is all over the ceremony and the language and in the things that we say. But we don't always mean the same thing when we use this term. So what does Jesus mean when he talks about it? 
To have any meaningful discussion with anybody these days, you have to define terms, right? Well, what are we talking about here? What do we mean by this term? What does he mean? And Jesus does that for us. 1 John chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. This is love. Not that we love God. So love does not originate in me, does not generate in my mind or my heart or yours, does not come from the sort of the, the best of wisdom of the culture. Love has a source and a starting point, and it's not in you, and it's not in me, and it's not in this world. But that he loved us, there's the source, and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This, this is love. What's love? This, that God is the source of love. And we know that because he sent Jesus to die for our sins. That's love. So then he says, dear children, since God loved us, we ought also to love one another. This is precisely what Jesus says in John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. I, we almost can't help but associate love with feelings and emotions. We might intellectually know that's probably not accurate, but we just can't help doing it. It's how everyone talks about it all the time. It's how the poets talk about it, how the songs talk about it, how our culture talks about it. I just walk it in this morning. I love the fall, right? Is that what, we mean we feel something about autumn and fall. I, I feel that. I enjoy that. The crisp air, the smell of burning leaves, football season, putting on sweaters. I love the whole thing. Here, I even just said it. I love, right? But Jesus is talking about something far, far different than how we feel about a season or a food group or a team or even each other. Biblically speaking, love has very little to do with how you feel because feelings come and go. I stood next to the groom yesterday. As the doors opened and the bride came in, I could, I could feel his legs doing this. He was so excited. You know. Feelings, right? Feelings come and go. You, if those of you that are married, you know this. You will not always feel that way in your married life. You'll, you'll, you'll drift out of that. There's something deeper. And Jesus talks about love. C.S. Lewis writes about this in an essay called God in the Dock, also in his book, The Four Loves, both outstanding resources. He writes this, love is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. I think this is a really helpful definition, but I would add two things to it. I know C.S. Lewis, I'm adding to C.S. Lewis. It's not the Bible, so we can do that. Right? <laughs> love is not affectionate feeling, but a steady wish a desire for the, the loved person's good. And I would add to wish action for the loved person's good. As far as it can be obtained, and I would add, even if it costs you something. So we might say it this way. Biblically speaking, love has nothing to do with how you feel in a moment. It has to do with your desire and action for the other person's good, even if it costs you something. So, so you can feel certain things for somebody, sentimental nostalgia, and not be loving them. As a parent, you can look at your kids and feel things for them. But if you're not desiring and working for their ultimate good, even if it costs you, even if they don't like it, you're actually not loving them. You're just having the warm fuzzies. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Oh, I love my wife. I feel nostalgic. I think about her. When, but are you desiring and working at cost to yourself for her ultimate good? And flip it around, wives to husbands. And this is what love is. Steady desire and action for the love person's ultimate good at cost to yourself. This is why 1 John 4, 10 says, this is love. That, not that we love God or felt something, but that he loved us, and we see it in his action. Our ultimate good, the forgiveness of our sins, at ultimate cost to himself. And this is a great definition. It's helpful to me to think about this when I'm talking about the relationships in my life. Can that definition apply to what, the way I'm living with my neighbors, with my friends, with the people I interact with? 
Now, why does Jesus say, lay down his life for his friends? Why, why wouldn't he say, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his enemies? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a better definition of love, a greater definition? I mean, a die for the, your friend, your close friend, you might do that, but what about loving your enemies? Aren't we called to love our enemies? Doesn't Jesus say on the cross, Father, forgive them? They don't know what they're doing. Isn't he loving those who are his enemies? Yes, of course, but I think what he's saying here is not, I'll put it this way. The comparison, I used to struggle with this. The comparison is not lay down his life, or uh, friends versus enemies. It's lay down your life versus uh, loan you some money. You see, the, the, he's saying the greater, com, the greater love comparison is in the length to which you would go, not necessarily the person you're, whom you're doing it for. He's speaking to, in John 15, who? 11 men. One of them's already left to betray him. 11 guys. And he's about to go to the cross. Of course, Jesus does lay down his life for his enemies. I'll read to you from Romans chapter 5. It's not here on the screen, but in Romans chapter 5, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in verse 8. If I can find verse 8. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then verse 10. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. We, we were his enemies. You might not have thought of yourself that way. I'm not the enemy of God. I'm kind of neutral about the whole thing. There's no neutral ground. But when we did not care, weren't thinking about him, or resisting him, or rejecting him, or going our own way, that's when he loved us and went to the cross for us. So let me ask the second question. Who should we love? Who do you love? Maybe you're thinking of a George Thurgood song now. I have all these songs from my, my head. To talk about love at all requires a who. There's a who to love. You, you, let me put it this way. You cannot follow the way of Jesus by yourself. I wish you could. Just me and, me and Jesus, me and the Bible and, and Jesus having spiritual times. Like Linus said to Charlie Brown, I love the world, Charlie Brown. It's all the people I can't stand. Right? Some of us feel that way. Pastor Brian used to jokingly say, ministry would be so much easier if it wasn't for all the people. <laughs> it also wouldn't exist. Sometimes we wish it was possible to do this, but when Jesus gives this command, he doesn't give it in a kind of general way, like love, love humanity, love your fellow man, or love the people, love, you know, Love the poor, the, the sort of theoretical, abstract poor that are distant from you. He says, love who? One another. Look at John 13, 34 and John 15, 12. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Who's the one another? Who's he talking to? 11 young men. Next slide. John 15, 12. This is my commandment. There it is again. That you love one another as I have loved you. This is one of the, the, the one another's of scripture. Forgive one another. Bear with one another. Pray for one another. Love one another. If you read through the New Testament, there's a lot of one anothering going on. You cannot follow Jesus on his way by yourself. You need a community. Just the other week, uh, I was, went, it was in the local gym that I go to, and I walked in, and I saw a guy I hadn't seen in a long time. He said, hey, did you get my email? And he had kind of like this strange look in his eyes. And I, I hadn't seen him in a while. I said, no, I, I didn't. Picked up my phone, looked it up, and I saw it, and he was asking for a meeting. And he said, not, not now, not now. I don't want to talk about it now. Okay. Got together with him. Uh, I won't go into the details, but deep, deep tragedy, brokenness, horrific things have happened in his life. And he realized, my father passed away years ago. I estranged from some of my family members. Got friends that, from fraternity brothers and guys I work with, but they're not really, they don't, have, they're not, they don't have the same faith I have. And it dawned on me, I don't have anybody to turn to right now. And he needed someone. 
Some, I think it's possible in the suburban, comfortable life that, we're, that we're, the, the, the world we're living in that you can live as if, and, and you can buy the lie and deceive yourself into thinking you don't need anybody until something happens. Jesus says to these young men, love one another. Now, why does he say love the world? He's going to the cross for the sins of the world. And they are going to go out into all the world. Are we called to love the world? Yes, but I, I think what's happening here is Jesus is, is start, he's making it practical and tangible. In some ways, it's easier for me to, to love the world from a distance than to love the person right next to me. Because that requires something of me. There's a cost. There's an edge to that. That's a living, breathing human being that's standing there, living there, that needs something from me. That I have to sacrifice for rather than just to say, oh, you know those people over there. And for some of you, God's blessed you so much, you can, you can write a check and send it, which is wonderful that you do. But, and feel as if that, that, that therefore I've, I've met the requirements of love. Jesus says to these guys, love each other. Let's start there. Yes, my love is for the whole world. Nobody's beyond the reach of my love. But let's make it practical, guys. Let's start right here with the people closest to you. You find that it's hardest sometimes to love the people closest to you? They know you best. That's what he's saying to them and to us. Bob Goff wrote a book called Everyone Always, the missing word love. Love everyone always. It's a great title and a lofty goal. I think Jesus is saying, well, let's, let's, let's narrow the scope a bit and start here. How about you start by loving each other? I think one of the worst witnesses in the world, right now, of the church, is the infighting among Christians. Is Christians who don't love each other. We throw stones at each other for voting the wrong way. We, we, we hate on each other, online and in person. They're the problem. I, I think the world watches that and says, well, they're no different. Look at those who claim to follow Jesus. They are hating each other just as much. Some of us are so concerned with being right. We're not thinking about being loving. And, I'm, and again, we talked about this already two weeks, three weeks ago. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is a truth that we abide by. But his command is the world will know you belong to me if you get everything right. The world will know you belong to me if you really know your, have all your theological and doctrinal I's dotted and T's crossed. This is how the world will know that you're mine if you post all the right stuff on Facebook. No, if you love each other. If they look at how my family, I remember years ago I went to Ecuador on a mission trip. The first time, we still go there, but years ago, the first time there, I was with this missionary family. They have six kids, and I had two little ones at the time. And I remember just observing their family in the mountains of Ecuador, watching the way that they, because you get up close and personal because we're, we're working together. I was so deeply moved by the way that this family loved each other, the way their kids taught the, other, the younger kids, the way they served, the respect, the grace. I thought, oh, I want that for my family. That's a metaphor of what Jesus is saying to these young men and to us as a church. Let's start right here. Love each other. Inside the family of God. If the family is dysfunctional, how are you going to be loving to the rest of the world? That's what he's getting at. So you might be tempted to think Jesus is making it easier on them. Let's love one another. I think he's making it harder because it's practical and tangible and real. Again, the quote from C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, he says it this way. Don't waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. Isn't this true? Like, how would your marriage be, men, if you waited around till you felt loving toward your wife? Now, you're probably going, she's sitting next to me. I always feel this way, honey. Right? <laughs> no, behave as if you did. Your heart follows your behavior. The truth is, I'm not always going to feel like it. That's not the measure that he's given us. The key point Lewis is making is in the word act, action, behavior. In the early church, the people of the way, they, they did not turn the world upside down because they had the warm fuzzies for their Greco-Roman neighbors. 
The world wasn't changed by this, this, the gospel infusing these people we call the church because they just felt certain things. It's because of the, what they did. It's because of how they acted at great cost to themselves. This brings us to the third question. How should we love? How should we love? 1 John chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, it's not on the screen, but it says, if anyone with earthly possessions sees his brother or sister in need, but withholds his compassion from him, how can the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us love not in word and speech, but in action and in truth. You know the five love languages, some of you, right? What are they? Physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, quality time, and what am I missing? Gifts. Who was said that? It sounded like a female voice that said that. <laughs> so my, mine are uh, physical touch and words of affirmation. And we express love the way we feel love, right? So I'm always, you're beautiful, I love you, I'm beautiful, I love you. My wife's are acts of service and quality time. She's like, talk is cheap, buddy. Let's do, <laughs> let's do the dishes. Right? You know, so. She doesn't say that, but her eyes do sometimes. Right? <laughs> the point is, right, the point is action, service. Laying aside your needs to express love. Church history is full of examples of the followers of Jesus doing exactly this. One excerpt from the book, Bullies and Saints. John Dixon wrote this book. I highly recommend this book to you. His, his whole premise is, if we're gonna talk about the beauty of what the church and Christian history has done, we also have to talk about our warts. We haven't always gotten it right. And here's one of the times we, we got it right. He, this is an excerpt. Final piece of evidence, he says, comes from 50 years later, right at the outbreak of the great persecution. In 8300, great persecution in Rome against Christians breaks out. This provides an intimate detail of the charitable programs in one church in a town called Sirta, North Africa. Roman officials enter the church hoping to confiscate hidden valuables. The church of Sirta did have several precious objects, mainly vessels for use in church services. They're listed in the report of what was taken. Two golden chalices, six silver chalices, seven bronze candlesticks, and so on. Then follows an almost humorous catalog of less valuable articles. Clothing from the church's storeroom for the poor. 82 women's tunics, 38 capes, 76 men's tunics, 13 pairs of men's shoes, 47 pairs of women's shoes, 19 peasant caps, and on down the list. Further inspections of the building found in a dining room. Four jars were there, six pots, all these full of food for the poor. Roman authorities had uncovered the real treasure of the church. It was in their charity and their love. They're looking for things that they could take that are valuable and they find where the church's riches were were in what they were storing up to give away. I think of that when I think of our Shepherd's Heart ministry. There's so many examples of this. The key is that our capacity to love is connected to our understanding and grasp of how much we've been loved. John 15, verses 12 through 13 again. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. There's the key phrase. We're asking the question, how? How should we love? He says, as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. As I have loved you. I'll show you an image here on the screen of, of a ministry called Radical Love. Some of you may know about Radical Love, started by Ellie LeBron. She's actually in the back there, which she's not going to like that I called her out, but you can talk to her later if you like. Ellie is part of a Chapel Street family, started with a little neighborhood club, uh, serving some kids in local schools that were refugee families and, and, and rallying uh, people in our community and her friendships and relationships to serve these kids, and it grew from there, and it's become a remarkable ministry. Um, they, they serve the needs of refugee families and children in all kinds of ways, tangible ways, teaching them. Uh, helping them learn English, providing needs for, the, for their clothing and food, housing, and coming alongside them, doing this together with people in our community. And I love watching it in action. Well, on their mission statement, if you go on their website, it simply says, a community of people that want to reflect the radical love of Jesus. I love that. That's the mission. How should we love? Tangibly, as we have been loved, at cost to ourselves. So maybe, maybe you just pause for a minute and you ask yourself this question. What act of love can you point to in the last week of your life that cost you something? Can you think back to where you felt it 
And maybe for you, it's not money. It's time. Time is your most precious commodity. You, you, you don't think too much about where the money goes because you've got plenty. But boy, your time is precious. Maybe it's the kind of people you spend time with. Last question. Why should we love? You might think, well, <laughs> you just said, Pastor Jeff, he commanded us to. Yes, he did. And because love has been poured into us, we love as, as we have been loved, yes. But he gives us another compelling reason for why we should love. Look at John 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. What a statement to these 11 guys, to the church. Here's how the world will know that you're mine, that you love each other. By this, all people will know. Authentic love that cares deeply for the needs of others validates our profession of faith in Jesus. You know, a couple chapters later in John 17, there's this thing called the great high priestly prayer of Jesus. You can read through it. It's beautiful. He's praying for his disciples, for the world, for us. If you haven't read that prayer, you should. And in chapter 17, verse 23, part of his prayer, Jesus says this. I and them, he's talking about Christian unity, loving unity. I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one. And then look at what he says again here. Gives another purpose, another reason why. So that the world may know that you, this is God the Father, sent me, God the Son, and love them even as I have loved you. You see what's happening there? Jesus says, when you love each other, the world knows that, you're, that you actually mean what you say when you say, I'm a Christian. And when we love each other, the world will know that Jesus isn't lying when he said, this is my mission. Think about that. I, I, this has been staggering me this week. The best evidence the world has that Jesus is telling the truth and that we really do belong to him is how we love each other. How are we doing? I mean, you come here and you sit by your people and you go home and how are you? Nice to see you. Right? How are we doing? How is the church doing? The prevailing view of the church in our culture is judgmental, hypocritical, intolerant, and terribly unloving. And if we're honest, sometimes the reason the world thinks that we're judgmental, hypocritical, intolerant, and terribly unloving is because we have been judgmental, hypocritical, intolerant, and terribly unloving. And we could say, well, yeah, but sometimes they just pick the worst examples. Yeah, okay. But there's still examples out there. I think Jesus is trying to change the narrative. And he's saying, let's start here. Let's change the script in our culture. And, and you can't fix what everybody thinks, but let's start right inside my family, the church. Let's start loving each other. At cost to ourselves. To desire and act for the love person's good, even if it costs you. Especially if it costs you. You want to know what love is? There's another song for you. <laughs> you don't need a poet or a philosopher, or a musician, or a songwriter, you need Jesus. And Jesus didn't give you a, a sermon, or a lecture, or a lesson, or a philosophy. He gave you a cross. And he's given the world his church to embody that love. And you and I are to be both recipients of, and channels or instruments of, his love. Because if you think about it, if we're supposed to love the way God loved us, and you think, well, what, wait, wait a second. That means that I gotta love unconditionally. I gotta love those who hate me. I gotta love perfectly. I gotta love even when there's nothing coming back my way. Who can do that? Maybe you're thinking, I can't. And you're right. You can't. But let's go back to last week. You're in Christ. You're not just on your own. You're in him. And in him, he does something in you that you could not do apart from him. Romans chapter five, verse uh, eight or five says, God's love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So we have this 
unending reservoir of love. Jesus never, you never come to Jesus and, he's, and he never goes, you ever feel this way like, I'm tapped out, I got nothing more, I, I got nothing more for these people. I mean, I have compassion fatigue, I need a break. Do you feel that way? Sometimes I do. Do you know Jesus never does? He never thinks, could you just leave me alone for a minute when you pray to him? Just give me a second to catch my breath. I'm a little, I'm a little burned out on all your needs. He never feels that way, ever. And he's poured his love, that love, into our hearts. And this is how we know what love is. I hope this doesn't hit you as a guilt trip. That's not the intent. The intent is to say, if, if we really want to follow the way of Jesus, and the way of Jesus is the way of love, and he's shown us in himself what love is, and he's told us that the world will know that he's telling the truth, and so are we, if we love each other. So let's do that. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, and we, we sometimes squirm under it because we're convicted by it. We recognize how far, far we fall short. And yet your grace is sufficient. And you've not called us to do this on our own because we could not. You've called us to abide in your love. And out of the never-ending reservoir of what you pour into our hearts, help us to love each other. Lord, we marvel that this is your plan. Love works that it flows from you into us, from us to each other, to our neighbors, and to the world. We thank you that you love us that way. In Jesus' name, amen. say this every week, but perhaps you're here this morning and you'd like someone to pray for you and to pray with you for any reason. Members of the prayer team are available in the classroom as you leave. Dear children, let us not love just with words and with speech, but in action and in truth, for that is how we have been loved by the Lord Jesus. Amen. And go in peace. <laughs>